Hello everyone. How's it going? Thanks for coming. Um, so thanks very much for inviting me to uh, Leeds Front End as the open speaker. Very uh, happy with that. Um, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at uh, S10WEN. Um, if you'd like to ask me anything regarding the talk, uh, just send me a tweet and I'll be happy to help you out. So a bit about me, I'm Simon Owen, and I'm a front end developer. Uh, these are some of the things that I've been involved with. Um, I run uh, DigiHike, which is a hiking group for geeks. And I also run uh, a monthly meetup in Manchester, uh, similar to this, uh, Manchester Fred. And also uh, Upfront Conf. Uh, has anyone been to Manchester Fred or Upfront Conf here? I think I've seen a few familiar faces. Thanks for your support. Um, the next one is going to be on the 16th of March 2018. If you'd like to stick that in your diaries, uh, it'd be great to see you there. A uh, few things I've been up to. Um, taught at Salford University. Uh, I've, worked, I've currently work at a big e-business platform called the Hot Group. Uh, we've run over 100 websites internationally, so that's good fun. Um, and also I've won uh, awards for different various sites that I've worked on for like a mere can, uh, some actors and various charities which is very nice. So a disclaimer, uh, before I begin, uh, <laughs> I'd like to mention that uh, in this talk, I'll be going some of the, over the things that help me in my workflow. Uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that these are gonna work for you. So I advise you to try out and figure out what works for yourself. Okay, but that said, here's a way to park a car. Pretty cool, right? Um, and here's another way. Yeah. <laughs> Here's another way. This one's probably my favorite. <laughs> Love the little flash of the lights there as well. And okay, um, let's wait for this to come around. And here's here's another way to park a car. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> So although there are different ways of doing things, the idea is uh, that some uh, ways may be better than others. So in the beginning, sometime around 1999, uh, using Web Studio, has anyone heard of that? <laughs> no, okay, um, this was version one, and it was for Windows. So going back a bit here. Um, I built a website, this was my URL. I was very proud of the URL. <laughs> um, and this is my website. Um, the Wayback Machine has saved this, but um, fortunately it didn't save the, the uh, there was a sky GIF background there. Um, don't know if you can see there, but you can select your different search engines there. Google's not even on it, <laughs> that's all this. And you can download MP3s and MIDI files and things like that, uh, Winamp skins. So I built a website, awesome. Um, here's a little video as well with some of the buttons. Is that gonna play? Okay, I need to play that over here. There we go. Oh, yeah. You get, get a bit of an idea there of what's going on. Angel fire. <laughs> this is GeoCities, this one. Um, okay, so over 10 years, a lot's changed. Uh, I'm now writing actual code uh, in sublime text here um, instead of using a graphical user interface. However, some things haven't changed. I still love GIFs. So we all know that the web is moving very fast. Uh, there's lots to learn. Uh, we can't learn everything. Don't try, it's not gonna end well. Uh, but let's not panic about that because we have help. And I'm here to help today. I'm gonna go over uh, four main topics, apps and tools, health, teamwork, and uh, my thoughts on improving produce, which is where I'll talk about the relationship between improving yourself and being productive. So first up, apps and tools. Uh, as a developer, I think it's really important that we test and use different browsers. Um, lots of people who visit your sites or whatever it is you're gonna build, uh, they're gonna be looking at it on different devices, different networks, these sorts of things. So it's important that as developers, we uh, make it accessible for them and try on these different uh, browsers and devices. So, um, as well as Chrome Stable, there's also Chrome Canary. Does everyone know about Chrome Canary? If 
view of you. Okay, so Chrome Canary allows you to see what's new with uh, Chrome and what's, what the Googlers are basically working on and what's coming on, coming next, which is pretty cool before it lands into stable. Uh, Firefox, Safari, Opera, and there's a whole host of others, but these are the main popular ones. A lot of these browsers have uh, great superpowers, and I often encounter developers who aren't aware of how much the browser itself can help. So for example, in Chrome, there's this thing called Chrome Flags, and this option can allow you to switch on extra settings um, to see experiments that uh, Googles are working on. Um, then also there's DevTools, which just you know used all the time in my workflow. And there's just so much you can do within the DevTools. Uh, so here, for example, uh, you can set network throttling. So you know we might be on a super fast connection, but your customer might be on a very slow connection. So here we can set up network throttling to see what that experience would be like for them and see how we can improve that. Uh, using device mode, it's possible to emulate different devices as well. Uh, this is very useful for responsive testing and also debugging. Um, one of the charity websites I built uh, relied heavily on CSS transitions and SVGs. Uh, using the timeline uh, was essential for me to avoid uh, junk. So does everyone know what SVG is? Scalable vector graphics, they're awesome. If you don't know what they are, I highly recommend going checking them out. And then uh, Jank, uh, if you're not familiar, is if you like scroll and you see this mainly with like parallax websites where there's lots of interactivity going on as you're scrolling down the page, sometimes it, the frame rate per second can be very slow and you get this sort of jankiness. Um, so using um, the timeline here, I was able to see where those janks were caused and look at different code that would make it more performant, take away that jank, and then as you, sc you scroll, it's brilliant when you get that nice, like, fluid, uh, smooth scrolling. I love it. So as I use a Mac, I also use VirtualBox, and this allows me to test Internet Explorer. Um, I also use a thing called Ghost Lab, which is a brilliant application. Uh, it's very handy. It allows me to um, drag and drop a URL into it, and then I can, uh, with any devices, I can keep like it in sync. So let's say, for example, you're uh, navigating a website on one on your main computer. All the devices will go with what that computer with what you're doing on the computer as well, saving you having to do it. Uh, multiple times. It's also really handy is because if you're trying to do like form validation and things like this where you've got to type in a lot, um, if you're having to do that on every single mobile device, it's very, very time consuming. Whereas if you can just do it on the computer and have it done across all the devices in one hit, it makes things a lot quicker. Um, version control, uh, I often use the command line for using Git and things like that. but. Um, Second, viewing changes for a commit and pushing multiple parts of file changes, I use, um, so I prefer a GUI. So, sorry, is, can, are you picking that up there? It sounds like a rocket's going off at the back. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll just continue. So, um, yeah, there's a, an app called GitHub Desktop, and I use that. So, yeah, when I'm doing uh, version control and things like that, using Git, I use the command line a lot. But then if there is, um, if I'm just going to do a simple diff, I'll use something like GitHub Desktop so I can quickly see the code that's changed. Um, then I also find Source Tree helpful for working on bigger projects and helping with uh, conflicts. So if, you've, if you're using version control and two bits of the same file has been edited and the, the version control doesn't know what you're going to, which bit of the code that you want, you'll get a conflict. And there's, uh, I use uh, IntelliJ a bit more for this now, but essentially it will say, I'm, I'm not sure what to do here. Please, can you give me a hand? So you can say, yes, I'd like to use this bit of code or this bit of code from here, or you can just accept theirs or yours. Or you can use fast push, but <laughs> <laughs> if you know what that is, don't know. <laughs> okay. Um, so for coding, I use uh, the mixture of different IDs actually at the minute. Uh, Sublime Text mainly I find very, very quick and very fast at doing different things within that. Uh, recently I'm trying out Visual Studio Code and I know a lot of people are moving to that and some of the things I really like within that, I'm still finding my feet in it. Um, and then yeah, I've mentioned IntelliJ. IntelliJ is really expensive, I don't pay for it. Um, the work, whoever work pays for it, but it is helpful for things like Java debugging. So. 
Um, as a front end, I don't do much on the Java sort of layer of it, but it is useful to just go into it and find out different things um, there. Uh, and it's got some, some other useful things as well, like I mentioned for doing uh, resolving conflicts and things like that I quite like, and also uh, database access as well. You can do through it. Um, if I'm doing a quick diff of a file, sometimes I just use a file merge. That uh, comes as standard with Max. And for command line, I use item as it gives you some extra features as opposed to the terminal, uh, some, like uh, split panes, a better search, and autocomplete, amongst others. Um, as a developer, I think communication is key. Uh, to help me communicate, I use various different tools, so like Skype for talking to people via webcam. Uh, Twitter, I find incredibly helpful, uh, asking for advice and keeping up to date with uh, what other developers are up to. Uh, then also Trello, uh, which is a web app that allows you to set up different groups and cards. Um, and you can also then assign people to those cards and you can track the progress of them and it's all free. It's great. Uh, Slack and HipChat becoming more and more popular as a means to chat instantly and share files, and as well as automating parts of a workflow, such as automatically posting commit messages when code is being pushed. Um, and I also find that Google Docs and Google Sheets are especially useful for collaborating um, with many team members. So for example, um, one of the ways that I've used Google um, Docs and Google Sheets is that uh, we were deciding upon our uh, style lint rules. Um, I didn't want to just blanket install like or set up all of my style lint rules because I think a lot of developers were just like, whoa, what, what's going on here in the business? So what we did was, uh, talked about and discussed them. So those people that weren't too sure about certain rules or too keen on them, um, we could go through and discuss them as to why or why not they'd be appropriate. Um, and then we could also add some sort of visibility on when those were getting introduced. So we could introduce them um, one at a time and also make sure that when we did introduce a new rule that we fixed all of those rules at the same time. Um, other essential apps for me include Spotify, uh, to listen to music, yes, definitely. Um, Dropbox to sync files across multiple devices and transmit to FTP and backup files on my own server. Uh, there are many tools that are available to us today, absolutely loads of them. Uh, some of the ones that I particularly like, um, Yeoman, which is really helps me just getting a quick prototype up and running. Uh, there's various different dependency management tools, uh, I use Gulp as well to create various tasks such as compiling uh, SAS to CSS and performance wins with minification. And I also love uh, Browser Sync, which enables me to uh, watch for my SAS changes and it will push those directly to the browser, meaning that, meaning that instead of having to go from like the IDE where I'm doing code back to the browser, hit refresh and keep doing this every time, um, as soon as I hit save in my IDE, it's going to show that change straight away in the browser. Okay, so second up, let's talk about health. Speaking of which, I'm gonna get some water. <laughs> also, human's great because you go, yo, man. <laughs> what Mike said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, moving on. Um, I believe that health is uh, far too often overlooked. If you don't look after yourself, all the work that you've put into being productive as possible it comes to a complete standstill. And here are some of the apps that I use uh, to help with my own health. Uh, one of the things that I've used uh, is called Headspace. Uh, does anyone use Headspace out of interest? Oh, cool. Good on you. Um, I find it really helpful. So I used to do this for like 10 minutes every day when I first started it, and I uh, found it really helped me to uh, refocus. Uh, often I miss days, but I tried not to stress too much about it, and I just pick it up again uh, when, I, when I could. Um, in an office environment as well, it can get very noisy. So to help with this, I use uh, noise cancelling headphones. There's some uh, gold ring ones that uh, a guy called Bruce Lawson, if anyone knows Bruce, uh, he recommended to me, which now you can pick up for about 60 quid. And they're a great introduction to uh, noise cancelling headphones. Uh, they are a bit flimsy. After a few years, they did like break, but I wrapped them up again and you, know, you can repair them. Um, now I've got some, uh, can't remember what they're called, but they're amazing. <laughs> it's by the same people that make the drones. Does anyone know? Yeah. AR, the AR drones. 
I'll post a link to them on Twitter or something like that. But uh, Parrot, there you go, remember them, Parrot. Uh, Zeke 3s, and they're a lot more expensive. Um, I got them from Germany for about 250. They're normally about 300 quid. But they're, to me, they're worth every single penny. Like, I, I wear them all the time and I can just concentrate so much more on them. I absolutely love them. Um, also, I, I don't know if it's a medical condition, but um, you know, if there's like little noises going on in the background, I tend to like really focus on them. And it, it, I find like noises just very distracting. If someone's like having like a discussion, I can't help but like sort of get into that discussion and like my brain just goes towards it. So for me, yeah, noise cancelling headphones are, are a must for me. Um, okay, sometimes uh, simply not having to uh, stand up all day and uh, also getting away from a computer and using uh, a notepad and pen can be the best option and uh, help you to work out a solution to a problem. Um, above all though, use your mind and think. There's no use in working all hours of the day and coding up a solution to a problem that doesn't actually exist. Research studies um, have shown that in dark environments, having a glaringly bright white screen can cause stress on your eyes and brain. So in order to help with this, Apple has introduced a feature called uh, Night Shift in iOS uh, that gradually reduces the amount of blue light later in the day before you go to sleep. And people have reported better concentration and better sleep patterns using this. And there's also an app you can get on uh, the Mac called Flux as well, which helps with this, which I'm a big fan of. Uh, here's a, an example. So you can see with the flux on there and it's using the less intense white light when it's activated. You always feel like I've got some sort of eye disease going on. <laughs> when it might start doing that, like, whoa, whoa, I've just been to make a cup of tea and my screen's gone funny. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird, yeah, if you've, if you've gone away and come back to it and you're like, whoa. But as, as it gradually sort of does it, you, yeah, you sort of, I, I find the same, like, you sort of hit a point and you're like, whoa, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> Whereas, yeah. Also, the iOS isn't nearly the iOS app isn't nearly as aggressive as Flux. Flux can go really like can go really crazy. Um, yeah, it's especially funny if you're watching a film <laughs> and you have it on and you're watching the film, and by the end of it, it's just all orange. <laughs> like, what's going on here? Um, so, uh, going back to browser superpowers, did you know that you can add themes to Chrome DevTools as well? Anyone? People who've seen me talk before will know. Yeah, <laughs> so bang on about it all the time. Um, so yeah, I did this one, which I was really proud of. Um, I don't really have that much time to keep it up, up to date these days. Um, I just basically uh, copied the Monokai theme. Um, but there's a guy called uh, Maurice Cruz, um, and he runs one which is actually, uh, this was a few years ago, actually, it was pretty difficult to install. It was a bit hard. You had to sort of inject some CSS into the dev tools. Whereas nowadays, Maurice Cruz runs a, uh, just a plugin or an extension for Chrome, which you can just simply add. And also, Chrome just has its own default dark theme these days, which is pretty cool. Um, but it, it can be a bit flaky at times, I've noticed. But um, they're doing some great work on that. Okay, um, I volunteer for Smashing Conf, and one year in Oxford, I really enjoyed Christopher Murphy's talk. Uh, it was entitled, A Good Writer is a Good Thinker. And one particular part of the talk that I really enjoyed was where Christopher talked about increasing your scope. And he spoke about, like, you never know when something seemingly completely unrelated to tech will in fact help you solve a problem or help, help you in your day-to-day -day, uh, dev life, which I, th I think is extremely true. Um, uh, so, here's an interesting graph. Um, the Finland education system takes a similar approach to this. So rather than mindlessly reading tutorial books to children, uh, they took a different approach. They have less hours in school and zero homework. And they encourage children to go outside, increase their own scopes, and work things out for themselves. And this resulted in a much higher uh, exam results. Incredible. Invented by an American, and then they didn't do it. <laughs> really? Yeah, didn't yeah. know that. We'll finish, we'll just read a book on an American role. That's not a good idea. Crack we'll implement it, it anywhere. It's wow. <laughs> Incredible. So, um, as well as increasing your own scope by learning about other things, I also find it better beneficial to have like a reset or a non-tech related hobby. Uh, so, I wrote an article in Net Magazine about this: how uh, Digi Hike. Uh, helps me to like unknot my brain, like as if I'm going go out and just get away from um, my computer, which is great. Um, so I, I also enjoy uh, hiking. There's a picture of me with some friends at uh, Mount Tibkal in Africa, and I also enjoy playing the piano. If anyone follows me on Twitter, 
every now and then I put a little periscope up and you can see me jamming on the piano. I love, love that, just getting away from all. Uh, so as well as meditation, uh, something else that I started doing was writing notes. Um, I've tried to pick this up again. I did stop doing it, but I really find that it's very beneficial being able to go back over, over these notes. So what I do is um, I spend about what, one to two minutes a day and I just write some quick bullet points and I try my best to be positive. So for example, instead of writing something like, oh no, I forgot my headphones today, that was rubbish, um, I rephrase it to say, remember my headphones for tomorrow, this will be better. So just flipping on its head. And I use two apps to do this. Um, one is called Plain Text, and that's uh, an iOS app. And I can create new text documents and update them on my iPhone, but it also syncs across with Dropbox as well, so I can do it on my computer as well. And uh, similar to meditation, um, I, I miss days. In fact, I've missed like whole months recently, but um, sometimes I'll just go back and refill them in. And I say, yeah, I've started it back up again now. So most developers spend a lot of time at their desk. Uh, so I think you should organize it to fit your requirements. And here's a photo of two developers in the UK that I know who have uh, shared their photos of their desks. Now one prefers a very nice clean desk, similar to the way that I like my desk, um, and one prefers a very messy desk, which is never to believe how my desk turns out. Um, <laughs> again, I don't think there's a uh, right or wrong here, but I would advise you to just have a think about like, how you've got your own desk set up and you know, if there's any improvements you can, you can make there. Uh, out of interest, can anyone guess? I think Mike, I think you've seen this one before. <laughs> but does anyone else know? Anyone wants to hazard guess to who those desks are? Okay, so the clean one is Andrew Clark's. Yeah, and the messy one is Anna Debenham's. <laughs> cool. All mine. <laughs> yeah, all mine. Like, or, or the way mine started off and the way it is now, yeah. <laughs> um, but above all, don't burn out. If you work yourself to illness, then you're not helping anyone. Next up, teamwork. Makes the dream work. Within a team, it's important to remember that everyone is different. People communicate in different ways, learn in different ways, and have different strengths and weaknesses. People can also change on a daily basis. You never know what might be going on in uh, someone's own personal life. Uh, within a team, uh, with so much variation, there's a lot to gain from making micro improvements. I love this post from James Clear, who writes about the British cycling team and how Dave Bailsford set uh, about making micro improvements uh, to win the Tour de France in five years' time. Uh, in actual fact, they managed to do it within three years' time, which is amazing. Uh, so they were constantly on the lookout at making micro improvements, and this made like a huge impact overall. And I, I keep going back to this time and time again and making these little mi micro little marginal improvements for myself. And um, one of the things that I really like about doing this is when I've got time and I spot an issue and think, oh, if I just did a particular thing, that'll help me in the future. And what, when it really, really helps these little micro improvements is when you're up against it. So if there's like a live issue, it needs to be fixed very quickly. And you can call upon like these superpowers, these super micro improvements that you've, you've made. I'll be going over some of them in a bit, but it's just, I find it incredibly, incredibly rewarding. Um, sublime superpowers. So this is some, a little video that I put together here, a, a thing called uh, Emmet, it was previously called Zen Coding. Uh, there's a link there with like all, all loads of different things you can do for it. So what you can do is it allows you to uh, write out a small string and then you, uh, or a letter even, and you can just um, tab it and it will auto complete. So here's the example I've done here. So you set up. Hopefully you don't need to do conditional tags for IE6 anymore. Uh, Got a header with an ID in it. Don't use IDs anymore, classes. Um, but you get you get the idea, so you can tab complete it. Uh, the A one, I really like. I don't know if you noticed that, but you do the A, and then the carrot is like here, so you can type in your alt tag. Sorry, the href here, right? And then when you do tab again, rather than like doing a tab space here, it brings you to here, so you can write in. Uh, your text there, 
very cool. And you can write your own as well for them. And yeah, there's, there's absolutely loads of them. Uh, here's another one. This is uh, called Align By. Oops, wrong one. Um, then also using like alt and holding down, you can do uh, multiple line editing, things like that. So just, there's just absolutely loads and loads of shortcuts and I love, love using them. Um, another thing as well is that um, uh, Pretty or Prettyfy these days as well does a really good job of uh, auto formatting your code as well. So um, I find it really helps um, if you're going to some code, especially like that you've not worked on in a while or if it's not your code. Um, if it's all indented correctly and you can see like the little code blocks, it makes it really easier to understand rather than everything, you know, going off screen. Um, so one of the most uh, important micro improvements, as I just mentioned, was, is shortcuts. Uh, most apps have shortcuts and more and more websites are also in introducing them, such as GitHub. Um, avoiding moving your hand from the keyboard to mouse or moving the mouse cursor from one side to the screen to another is a great time saver over time. Um, one day, many, many years ago, a friend of mine came over to me when I was using Photoshop and said, oh, I challenge, and I'm like, yeah, go on then. So what he did was he hid the toolbar on Photoshop and he just said, don't turn that on for the rest of the day. And I've never turned it on since. Um, and I do similar things with different other applications. So these days I don't tend to use Photoshop as much. I use Sketch, but same same rules apply. I try and learn the shortcuts pretty pretty quickly. Um, so here's a video. Me doing doing that. So yeah, window tools. Bye bye. And yeah, you get more space as well, which is nice. So here I'm just dragging this image, doing like Command C, Command V, fairly standard. Uh, bringing that over there. Uh, Command L, I think it is for new new layer. Uh, creating marquee, G for the uh, bucket. Quite quite that just to get it so it's aligned. Uh, uh, here I'm sort of demonstrating that if you hold down certain keys as well, you can keep it in alignment. Like shift and Alt. Going to Chrome for some reason. Oh, <laughs> taking a screenshot. The claw. The claw. Command, Alt, Shift, S. Yeah, using the mouse Save for web. For web was easier yeah. than the claw. No, the claw is cool. It's good, good for crimping as well if you do bouldering. <laughs> Climbing. I gave one kid about 70 files in one day once. <laughs> and I had severe pains in my left arm. <laughs> and then I had an office junior. <laughs> Could have automated it. Done a batch script. Uh, yeah, it wasn't the kind of yeah, sorry, I couldn't. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea. Um, something else I uh, also find extremely useful is being able to use a keyboard without having to look at it. So this saves time because you're not having to constantly move your head back and forth to the screen and the keyboard. Um, and also it's useful if you can start like if you can just type and have a conversation uh, with someone else. Um, I'll be able to type what they're saying whilst like looking at them rather than just go your head down. Um, so to aid uh, with this, there's a thing called the uh, DAS keyboard. Um, I've never really used it myself, um, but I've heard people have used this and it's been helpful. You can also um, get like a, a wireless Mac keyboard and you know just take off all the letters or get a custom one with no letters on it. Um, uh, or there's like various different online free app, uh, applications as well that you can use to try and help you to touch type that will sort of try and figure out what the keys that you're struggling with and try and help you to basically get faster at typing and not look at the keyboard. Uh, setting performance budgets can be a great help. Um, if you put a new site live and you're going to develop on it over time, 
um, and monitor performance. Then if you've got these performance budgets and you're monitoring it, then if something goes uh, over the threshold, then straight away you can go in and fix it and debug the issue quicker because you've got some sort of monitoring there and it'll be help you to debug what the actual issue is. So for example, one of the things you could track the amount of HTTP requests that you have, uh, your first load page, page load time, sorry, and uh, four fours. Uh, Brad Frost does even a handy tool, uh, which is called uh, the Performance Budget Builder. Um, so you can go onto uh, looks like it's code pen there, and yep, tailor that to how you require it. Okay, where's my cursor gone? Second. So how often do you hear this? Um, there's too much to do. It's too much code. All the code is, however you'd like to say that word. <laughs> Recently, um, I've been working on a huge project, uh, 10, 10 years worth of legacy code, and I've been looking to improve inconsistencies across all the buttons. Now, as I looked for the button code, I discovered code in the JSP templates, the handlebar templates, Java code, and other random files. Um, it was a big task, but I broke it down into smaller, more manageable tasks and then started making my way through each one of those smaller tasks. And I took the same approach uh, for writing uh, these slides and this talk. And I don't know about you, but I'm not a fan of doing mundane tasks at all. Copy, copying and pasting the same code over and over, copying and pasting anything just gets very time consuming and I get very frustrated with it. Uh, therefore, I love things like automation. One day I discovered uh, this thing called dot .files. Uh, it was a dot fi .files repo on GitHub uh, where Matthias Spinans and uh, Paul Irish had been doing some various stuff and it looked really interesting. I had no clue how it all worked, but I understood that what the idea was and how it would help in the end, uh, which would be to help with the workflow and especially setting up a new, new machine. So I forked the, rep the repository and then I started going over it line by line. And uh, from doing so, I learned uh, a lot and it drastically improved my workflow. And I learned various different other like coding languages and things like it opened up my eyes to a whole host of other things that I hadn't really touched before with like bash scripting and things like that. Uh, <clears throat> so I'm gonna go over some of them now, but if you're interested in learning uh, more on this, I, I've also wrote uh, an article that's up on uh, Toots Plus. Um, I wrote two, and there's a third one that I want to write, because what I did originally was I forked it, and I went over all of the code. And it's pretty, there's quite a lot of code in there. What I'd recommend nowadays is set up a dot .files repo with nothing in it, and then start like, adding the bits in and as you understand them. It's a bit easier to do. And also, this was like maybe four years ago, five years ago, that I started doing this. And it was really nice that actually, um, Matthias, who helped me like to understand all of his dot .files, uh, kept in contact with him, and we actually had him over to Manchester for Upfront Conf, so that was, that was really nice, and you, you, know, you never know where these things are gonna lead. Um, so first of all, let me briefly explain to anyone, everyone what a dot .file is, in case anyone hasn't heard of them before. A dot .file is simply a file name that has a dot at the start. And this might seem very obvious, but I've met a lot of people who didn't really understand this, and when it clicks, like, ah, right, yeah, that makes sense, a dot file. Cool. So one dot file I use for every project is called the editor config file. So it's literally a file that's dot editor config, and then within that you can set some uh, rules. So one of the things that I really like is the, you can set the <coughs> indent styling rules there, and you can also trim trailing white space, and there's, there's a whole host of different ones that you can use there. So I think it it's really helps with keeping um, the code base consistent, uh, easy to understand, and it can just automate a lot of things that you, then you just don't need to worry about because it handles it all for you. Um, these aliases, uh, sorry, the aliases dot file allows me to set up some handy shortcuts. So for example, if I'm in item and I wanted to open the current directory in Sublime Text, I could type S, and for easier navigation of directories, rather than having to do cd space dot dot and, and that sort of thing, you can use uh, just dot dot instead. So it's pretty simple. You, you can see here, uh, you set up the alias with what you want it to be, equals, and then you add in your code here, and it'll alias to it. Um, 
quite often I want to start a new project by creating a new directory, they're doing something inside of that directory. So ordinarily what, ordinarily, what you do is you do um, mkdir, which would make the directory, and then you'd have to cd into it. So it's two steps. Yes. Yeah, it's not the one I want to do. <laughs> so I've got this in my functions here. So this is a function that's just mkd, and what this allows me to do is mkd my site name dot dev or whatever you want to call it, and then it creates the directory and also you're in it in one hit. <laughs> like a million times I've git clone and then gone like git See status and went, what do you mean it's not a git with direction? <laughs> what? Oh yeah. It's See not. the into it, yeah. yeah. Nah. So um, this one's really cool. So previously I mentioned that I'm working on a, um, a refactor for some button code um, and that the code was in various multiple files and as such sometimes it was very difficult to find the actual code I was after. So if you can imagine, you know, like there's someone's putting a class there of BTN, and then that's got copied and pasted all around this code base, of which now there's like maybe a thousand. You know, in order to find out which act, where you actually are in that code base would be extremely time consuming to drill down and try and find the correct one. Um, I was getting extremely frustrated with it, so I was like, I need a I need a better way of doing this. Um, than drilling down into it manually. I want to automate this. So I came up with this idea. I talked to uh, my friend Craig, who's awesome, and he helped me uh, with this with Bash Script. Um, a bit of pearl, it looks like, in there. Don't know if anyone has any sort of clue what that's doing. <laughs> but um, what it's basically doing is it, um, from, the, your terminal now, you can do find me and put like a string of the thing that you're trying to find. But what it'll do, and so like in the example of button, it'll find the first instance of button, go btn, and then add a one to it, to the end of that string, and then the second one it'll add two, and it'll keep doing that. Now what I can do is give a refresh on the front end and find like button 42, and I know that that's now the only one. So I could do a search for btn 42 in the project and I know that that's, that's the one that I'm working on. I'll do a git hard reset so I'm back to where I am and I know that that's the button class that I'm working on. Brilliant. Well done Craig. That's fucking awesome. Oh, very awesome. Okay, um, so that's clever and it's awesome. How but many times have you accidentally committed? <laughs> never, 12, never. The, the amount of like <laughs> code that would be going in there would be crazy. No, yeah, never. Um, so, clever, yeah, but don't try to be too clever. Uh, things can get overcomplicated. Like this guy. <laughs> Whoopsie. And yeah, then things can get inefficient if it's too overcomplicated and people don't understand how, what it's working, why it's working and what it's going, you know, you get the idea. Um, so there's a principle um, for this, which is called KISS, which is to keep it simple, stupid. Do you like? Um, and another thing to consider is, well as uh, overcomplicating uh, and going back to using your mind, is to always question whether or not you actually need something in the first place. I think this is incredibly important. The amount of times, um, I think as developers, we're all, uh, we all can sometimes just get onto the computer too quickly and start coding something up and be like, oh, this is really cool. When actually, you know, do you actually need it in the first place? So for example, um, when you've established the things that you require, uh, evaluate and prioritize them. So which would be best? You know, a delightful Retina Hero image weighing in at 20 megabytes, or allowing people to view the site quickly and offline, like maybe implementing service workers. Has anyone heard of service workers? Anyone using those? Brilliant, you'll all probably be familiar with this maybe some of you aren't, but they have a logo, which is brilliant. It's this. Yeah. Cool. So we all know the service workers logo now. <laughs> Turn it off. Not leave it on for another minute. Is it actually moving? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe just for you, Mike. Cool. So I've left that up there for way too long now. <laughs> um, so add sugar as required, 
Um, so there might be a new fancy tool that everyone's using, like Gulp, Broccoli, Fez, whatever it is now, React. Uh, but again, like ask yourself, you know, do you actually need it? And um, if you do find out that you do like maybe potentially need it, then what I'd recommend is having a taste first. <laughs> so you can see what it's like for yourself and whether you actually do need it or not. I don't <laughs> Okay, um, and there's plenty of online tools which will help with this, such as JSBin, uh, CodePen, and JS Fiddle. Oh, brilliant online tools. And something else that can often uh, help out when trying to uh, trying out something new is um, a test case reduction. So if you're working on a large code base, and implementing some, some, something new within that code. Uh, there may be additional complications with getting it set up um, with your existing code base. So in order to help with this, sometimes it's better to reduce the amount of complication and to get the new code working by itself first. Uh, then it, you can implement it into your code base once you've figured out what's going on. So uh, Jake Atchbald, who's a uh, Google developer advocate, uh, he helped me fix uh, an issue that's caused uh, by a bug in Safari uh, using this method. So he was able to just yeah, get a reduced uh, test, a test case re reduction, reduced test case, which I'd like to, however you'd like to word it. Um, and yeah, we was able to figure out that it wasn't anything to do with the code I was doing. It was just, it was something to do with the actual Safari browser itself. So um, when implementing something new, it's important to make sure the rest of the team also understands how it works. Uh, if you've been working on it for a long time, simple things to you might not be so simple for someone uh, who is learning it for the first time. So consider how you can make things easier for the team members to understand what you've been working on. Uh, some things that can help with this are like uh, documentation, if you've got like an internal wiki or Confluence, or even if it's just a re repo with uh, static site generator markdown, whatever. Um, yeah, always try and think about uh, potentially like <laughs> A, a good one is, what about your future self? So I do this quite quite a lot. I like adding code comments or creating little um, documentations for myself. I love it like when you can come back to something like a six months, 12 months down the line and go, oh no, how, how does this thing work again? And you've wrote some, a little bit of documentation. You can go, ah, yeah, it's that thing. And that's awesome. Um, above all, don't go solo in a team. Uh, implementing your own code because you want to, that's going to disrupt or change everyone else's workflow, isn't going to go down well uh, with the rest of the team. You might as well just jump out the window. <laughs> okay, fourth up, improve and produce. Uh, this last section is small, but I think it's one of the most important, and I encounter this issue constantly. So you're asked to improve some code and produce some new work. Um, so you if you improve the code and you produce new work and you continue in this way, then that's what will happen. However, often you will be asked to produce the work and you know just, just get it done. And what you can do um, to get the work done faster. So what happens is you produce the work and say that you're gonna improve it in phase two, but then some more work comes in and more and more and phase two never happens. And you end up with producing a lot of work and a lot of poop uh, to go with it. And then as time goes on, uh, more and more poop has been added all over the existing poop and you're in a whole <laughs> poop filler. And yeah, there you go. So uh, to help combat with this issue, I think it's important to highlight to the business uh, code debt as soon as possible. So for example, if a piece of work comes in and you estimate a day in order to do it properly and the business requires you to do it in a half day, you can say, okay, can hack it in, but it's a hack, and we can get it done. Uh, it's going to take you half day, but then it's going to take another X amount of days uh, to go back and refactor it, which is something that we, we must do, we need to do. And if it continues, then you can evaluate all the work done and all the code debt that you've introduced. Uh, use this thing, code debt card, plug it in. And um, generally, the more bad code that goes in will then also have an impact on other aspects. So further work produced is going to take more time to complete. It's more likely to break. It's more likely to have bugs. It's probably going to be harder to work on uh, in the future. It's going to then take 
longer to work on in the future with other team members as well, and it's probably going to be less performant. So this approach uh, will also be beneficial for managers, so they're fully aware of the issues that arise when rushing coding and the need for time allocation for self-improvement. Um, so yeah, uh, an agency in Manchester called Code Computer Love, I believe, use this. So yeah, they say like, look, we, we can do this. And you know, if you use like uh, Agile or Scrum, anything like that as well, you can add these sorts of things into your sprints. You can say, okay, look, we've done this, but now we've created another ticket because we need to go back and sort this out. And if like after a month, you know, you've still not been given the time, you can go to you know the business and say, look, you know, we've done these things. How much money did that? like actually bring in how much revenue did that bring in you know like what what were all the benefits from doing that and did those outweigh all of this now that we've got and that's now impacting us going forwards so before i finish the talk i'd like to go over some closing thoughts um at the start of the talk i mentioned about communication and twitter uh, so for this talk i actually use twitter uh, to gain feedback from the community regarding what people were using in their workflow and where they were running into issues then using this feedback, I created notes and set up the slides to address them. Thanks to everyone that helped me there. Um, I've shown this graph a few times in various talks and it all seems to, always seems to go down well. Uh, the person who always copies and pastes will get it done and it'll be right, but over time uh, it's going to become consuming and very boring. Whereas the geek developer uh, will get frustrated of doing the mundane task. They'll write a better solution and then much, be much more faster uh, going forwards and be able to get on doing something more interesting going forwards. Um, the geek always wins eventually. So you can see here, the non-geek is like, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. And then the geek goes, copy, paste, copy, paste. Uh, this is boring, I don't want to do this. Writes an automated task and goes, boof, and then goes off to do awesomeness. Um, so this site's pretty cool. Uh, speaking to Scott Jensen, who's doing uh, amazing work with the physical web. Uh, we were discussing about how everyone has that first encounter of the internet and the World Wide Web. Um, I like this page, which is entitled called This is a Web Page. And it reminded me of why I first got into web development. You know, although I've been over so many different tools and processes and things today in this talk, um, you can still just FTP into a server, uh, create a document, write a bit of HTML, some words on it, and it can be viewable. Uh, across the world, and that's really incredible to me. One more thing. Here's a secret. I'm Nicholas Gallagher. Um, even if you're new to front-end development, or have been doing it for many years, no one else knows what they're doing either. Things are changing all the time. It's new for everyone. Uh, but this keeps things very exciting and sometimes frustrating with different options. But I love this and the willingness that we all have as a community to help one another and learn together. I think we're so, so lucky as a front-end web development community. Like the amount of like, you know, help that I just have readily available from other developers around the world for free, they never ask for anything back, um, I think is incredible. And I try to do that as well myself. Because I won't be in the position that I am today if it wasn't for them, and I hope that I you know, can help other people, inspire them to do the same. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope some of the topics I've covered will help you in your day-to-day -day workflow. Cheers.